Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Octane Press chat tonight to celebrate Johnny Andretti and his autobiography titled Racer. My name is Dylan Welch. I'll be your host this evening. Uh, quick background about myself. Uh, driven race cars since I was age seven, starting in quarter midgets and, and now racing occasionally with the United States Auto Club and their national midget series. Uh, my main job during the week is uh, or weekend is working with NBC and the Motor Racing Network as an announcer for NASCAR and IndyCar and, and some IMSA races. Um, I'm not the important guest tonight, though. I've known John and Jared a long time and am honored to be a part of tonight's event. Uh, again, my name is Dylan Welch. Excited to be here. Excited to host this great event. Uh, time now, though, to meet the, uh, the important guests, the people that you really want to hear from. We'll start first with Jade Gers, the co-author of Racer. Jade has written books with Dale Earnhardt Jr., with Daryl Waltrip, uh, as well as the book Beast, which documents uh, Roger Penske's secret engine program from the 1994 Indianapolis 500. He's been in motorsports for over 30 years, has worked with drivers like Dale Earnhardt Jr., uh, companies such as Mercedes-Benz, Mazda, and Andretti Autosports. So please welcome Jade Gers. Hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us tonight. Also with us tonight, uh, a gentleman who wanted to be introduced only as John Andretti's son, uh, but he's building a diverse racing career of his own. He's a graduate of North Carolina State University, currently racing with the United States Auto Club in sprint cars in the Midwest and preparing for another season as well in the GT4 America Series on road courses across the country. Please welcome Jarrett Andretti. How's everybody doing? It's good to be here. Thank you guys. And finally, our guest of honor this evening uh, is somebody who many of you are quite familiar with. He immigrated from Italy to the United States at the age of 15, hasn't slowed down once since then, was voted driver of the century in 1999. He's the only driver to win the Formula One World Championship, the Indianapolis 500 and the Daytona 500. He's the twin brother of John's father, Aldo. Please welcome Mario Andretti. Howdy, everybody. Thanks for including me. Mario, we'll start with you. Before we get to, uh, to the guest questions, uh, family meant the world to John. Uh, he clearly looked up to you. Uh, do you have a favorite memory just off the cuff of, of John? Well, uh, every memory I've had, I have with him has been favorite because uh, – even though we're a close family uh, and, uh, you know, we spend quite a bit of time together, it seemed like uh, uh, everything was going so fast because uh, we were always very, very busy. When, even when John was uh, beginning, uh, you know, his racing career alongside with uh, my older guy, <laughs> Michael, um, you know, I was, uh, in fact, in those days I was traveling all over. I was in Formula One quite a bit. And um, so, uh, again, I passed and, and crossed that, didn't spend a lot of the quality time together. Uh, you know, my, my favorite times were always uh, when we were up at the, at the lake, and we call it the lake. It's a, it's a property that uh, I bought, um, you know, back in 1968, and it was just, uh, it's the best thing I've ever done in my life because uh, it's a retreat. Uh, it's a place where uh, you... Well, I have every toy imaginable there, as you can imagine, and as you can probably see, uh, or hear, because everything I have makes a, quite a bit of noise. And, uh, and you know, the times that we had up there, you know, they're, they're always golden because, uh, you know, that's when we really let our hair down. I mean, uh, uh, you can water ski, you can play tennis, you can just uh, also, you know, since back in the 80s, uh, I have an ultralight. We've been flying an ultralight there. Uh, we have race boats. And, um, you know, the, one of the favorite things there, we, we, we talked about that earlier with Jared, that um, uh, up at the lake, uh, I, I bought this uh, race boat that was a, a world champion uh, back in, uh, in Italy from the Molinari family, which, which, you know, they're very important. They're like Ferrari, you know, when, uh, when it comes to, uh, to uh, you know, Motor boats uh, and um, uh, hydroplanes, I should say, and uh, and so anyway. But it was the, the thing was already a few years old. But the man can that thing go? And uh, so we had it up at the lake, and and we were all scared of it. And John says, oh, "I have a go at it," you know. I said, and he's the first one that ran the lake flat out, and I mean throwing the rooster tail up in the trees, you know, and everything. So. I mean, things like that. It was crazy. And the second driver was Michael, and then he wound up in the rocks. I think he turned too late at the end of the lake. 
and uh, and the thing just chattered all the way out to the rocks, you know, stuff like that. But uh, we always, like I said, we always had a laugh about things, about water skiing, about um, anything that, again, you know, takes a little bit of effort. Uh, John was always a hoot to have around, no question. Your dad was a great, go ahead, Jay. I was just going to jump in. John talked about that boat ride. He said, <laughs> I just drove it like a sprint car. I, I just drove it like a sprint car. Exactly. So, anyway. <laughs> yeah, it seemed like it. It, like when you're going to turn, it, you, know, you know, all you do is you pitch it just like, you know, you, you go up on a cushion, you know, and the thing just bam, 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 but you got to stay on it, you know, and uh, the throttle. Oh, I mean, it's, uh, it's really, it's really fun. I'm still scared of it. <laughs> <laughs> Jared, your dad was a, was a great storyteller in his own right. Is there anything, uh, maybe even memories from the lake or, or any other stories in particular that you always enjoyed hearing from him? Yeah, I mean, we traveled up and down the road quite a bit, um, going to sprint car races and going to Silver Crown races and doing stuff. So I, I, I heard a lot of these stories. And every time you heard them, you got more and more detail from it. And some of the stuff you really had to pull out of them. So kind of coming, talking about the hydroplane, um, I was able to get out of him here recently. I, I guess he had a uh, opportunity, and I guess he was going to do it, to drive a hydroplane. And it was like 94, 95. And then the sponsor of the cup car was also the sponsor of the hydroplane. Uh, but the cup car owner put the Knicks on that deal. And uh, he was, he was just going to do it and not tell him. And, uh, and that didn't get, that didn't quite fly. But um, <laughs> he was, the, the thing I liked, I loved about him was I got to, we'd sit on the couch and even in November and things like that, when he wasn't feeling good, we turned on Bathurst and I was, I was able to, I would watch Bathurst or I watch, California in a cup car or an Indy car race at Long Beach or a top fuel dragster, it didn't matter. And say, okay, well, what's it like to do that? What is that corner flat? Or why is that guy doing that? Or can you hit the apron there? And it was just, you could just pepper him with questions. It didn't matter what kind of motorsports it was. He always had an answer for it because he had done it. Um, and the only stuff, the only really thing that he hadn't ever driven was a Formula One car. And um, so whenever I had questions about that, I can always call Mario, but uh He's usually a talk to Mario about that and said, this is what Mario said about this race. And this is what, and uh, so anyway, it was, those, those are the stories that I miss. And I, I actually looked over kind of at my couch yesterday. I was watching Talladega and I looked over and I was going to, why, why did, uh, you know, I don't, I didn't get to ask him, you know, I was, well, why did the guy do that? You know, um, but uh, usually at Talladega, it's why did the guy do something that dumb? But, um, you know, or, or Daytona, right? But um Anyway, uh, th those are the stories that those are the things that I missed the most. Certainly a diverse career behind the wheel. And, and Jade, before we, we do open it up to the, the fan questions here, uh, this I would imagine was an extremely fun project for you. You've gotten to work with a lot of uh, a lot of talent, like we said. But how did this particular project come together? Uh, I first met John in 2004. I was the PR rep for Dale Earnhardt Jr., and Dale had gotten burnt in a, in a sports car. So we had John join us to be the backup driver or the emergency driver. And um, I just, I, I really liked him. I liked that he, he told great stories and he seemed to remember everything. So that always stuck with me. And um, I followed when he, he got sick and I followed the news and uh, I kicked myself that I didn't think of it earlier, but it just it just hit me one day that there would be nobody better than John Andretti to to do a book to tell his story. And I reached out to him, and immediately he replied and he said, "Oh, this would be great. Uh, it, something good could come of this." Meaning the the fight he was having with cancer because he was so committed to to sharing his story to try to get people to get a colonoscopy, the, the hashtag check it for Andretti was, was something that he really believed in. And uh, so there's a lot of that in the book and his work with Race for Riley, which I think we'll probably chat about a little later. But um, so that's how it started. And I would go to his, his house, to Jared's house there at, at Lake Norman, and we'd sit downstairs and just, just like kind of like this, just kind of start talking, telling stories. And um, it just, for me, um, as a writer, it was great, but as a race fan, it was amazing. That, that was the best part of it for me was just as a fan. So, uh, it really does my heart good to be able to share those stories that he told, um, 
with the rest of the world. So it, it means a lot to me. I'm excited for all of you to get to check out those stories as well. And, and as, as Jade mentioned, uh, we do want to mention that 10% of all the proceeds uh, from this book are going to John's chosen charity, and that's Riley Children's Foundation, uh, supporting the Riley Children's Hospital in Indianapolis. John was a, a great and a passionate supporter of that hospital with his, his own event, The Race for Riley, uh, raising more than $4.8 million dollars um, for the foundation with that event. So uh, Jared and the Andretti family are carrying on John's legacy by continuing to raise money and awareness for the hospital. So uh, just keep that in mind as well. If, you, if you're um, recommending the book that the 10% of, of all the proceeds do go to the Riley Children's Foundation. So a great cause for sure. Okay, it is time now. We're going to get into the questions that you, the fans have submitted. So uh, we've chosen some of our favorites and uh, we'll get right into it. This one is from Dan, uh, the Outer Banks in North Carolina. It's for Mario. Uh, Mario, your favorite race, were you and John in the race together? Why was it your favorite? And who finished ahead of the other? <laughs> well, I, let's, let's, I don't know if it was my favorite race, Milwaukee, but uh, that's, uh, that's the one where, doggone it, you know, I was... Um, I should have been really happy uh, because uh, the three of us were on podium. Uh, but the fact that I was third, you know, all of a sudden you can see I wasn't smiling that much. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's one of those things, you know. Um, you know, one thing, doggone it, then you say, well, those are my boys. You know, so there's a double-edged sword that, that goes with it because we're all very competitive. But, uh, you know, uh, as a family, how many times do you have those opportunities, you know, to have the family on podium? Uh, and um, here's John. I mean, uh, 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 what, both years, with 91, 92, the, the four of us uh, racers, uh, you know, at Indianapolis, you know, with John and Michael and Jeff and myself. And, and again, it's it's first time and the only time so far ever that you have four members of the same family uh, entered it, it actually not just enter in the race at Indy. So there were so many moments like that. And, um, and again, uh, uh, I think going on, uh, to be, uh, teammates at Le Mans, you know, uh, with the factory Porsche back in 88, uh, you know, was another great time again. And, uh, you know, John already had, uh, had won Daytona. I know he was really, uh, already very, very, uh, you know, he had a lot of experience in sports cars uh, as well, long distance and Porsches. And, you know, I thought we had, we were, we made a pretty good team at the time. And, uh, and we had uh, Norbert Singer was uh, the team manager, which was the top guy at, uh, you know, as far as one of the best team managers Porsche probably ever had. And he, he kind of always, he kind of liked us and, uh, we really, we stuck to his strategy, you know, and, um, and he says by one o'clock in the morning, I so said, you're going to be taking the lead. And uh, the way that the strategy worked out, you know, was really, really, uh, uh, it was in the realm of things. And, uh, and uh, Lord and behold, you know, our luck, uh, we lost the cylinder. At, um, and uh, at that point, they didn't know what to do, except that they, um, they pulled the plug and that uh, we ran five cylinders uh, the rest of the way and we still finished sixth. Uh, but uh, the fact that, uh, you know, uh, here we were, the, you know, the three of us together. And, uh, and I mean, we were like, we we're running like, you know, five cylinders, but like we're qualifying because uh, uh, what helped us was we had like uh, about three hours or three or four hours of wet and rain and uh and you know we were really uh, we were holding our own believe it or not you know in the wet uh, with uh, uh it was like having a uh, traction control <laughs> but but so it, it, like i said it's moments like that they're so precious uh and uh, you know as a family we had we had a few and uh and 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 that's it there's one that i, I said this before that i totally regret and I think, um, and he, uh, I wish he would have slapped me on the side of the head, but I basically I, I caused a crash. I crashed him in Nazareth at the start of the race. Um, uh, 
I think we were second row or something. And, uh, and, and I, uh, I don't know, the, I think it was uh, Derek Bailey in front of me, he hesitated and, uh, and I knew John, I kind of knew he was on the right here. He was, and I moved over and I thought, well, he's gonna, you know, he's gonna kind of check, check it out and check it a little bit. But uh, anyway, I put him in a wall and I felt so bad, I figured. And still to today, you know, it's something that um, I wish that, like I said, he would have been more aggressive, but he never mentioned it. He never mentioned it ever, you know, and, um, and, uh, that made it even worse, you know, so I'm, I'm carrying this. It's a big weight. <laughs> That's fascinating. Uh, Jarrett, this one is for you from Ralph in New Freedom, Pennsylvania. He says, your dad raced and won in all different venues, but which was his favorite? I know winning the Daytona 500 or any fi Indy 500 is every racer's goal, but if he could have won one, which do you think he would treasure the most? You know, this is... Uh... Without a question, um, the Indianapolis 500. Um, I I didn't get to go to. I grew up. I, I was born in '92, and so he really transitioned to NASCAR '94. So I got to be a part of um, going to the Brickyard for the NASCAR race, going to Daytona um, 500, and all those big NASCAR races. Really see the rise of that through the years, the late two, you know 1990s and early 2000s. But I didn't get a chance to go to Indy till I was about 14, 13, 14. And that's kind of the first time I ever saw my dad nervous. Um, we were on the grid and I'm like, this is, this is just another race, right, dad? And he's, he's like, you don't get it. And uh, we got to the grid and the grandstands look like they're getting ready to collapse on you. They got so many people and they sing back home in Indiana and they release the balloons and, and he gets in and he goes, um, you know, about 200, you know, he goes 200 plus, 220 plus. And I said, okay, now, now I get it. And now I get the allure. And uh, that's kind of when he made his, his trek back to, uh, to Indianapolis and run those four or five years there in the, in the Window World car and the Camping World car. Um, so it would have been, without a doubt, the, uh, the Indianapolis 500. And um, he had a special affinity for that place. He really loved it as a driver as well. He, he always said whenever he got there, originally, he just, he just felt comfortable there. And, um, and I think that shows in some of his finishes in, in cars that maybe wouldn't have been as successful and also his ability to qualify, you know, for all of his 500s. Actually, at one point, and I think Jade mentions this in the book, is he, he helped multiple cars qualify one year until he ended up um, climbing into AJ's car and, uh, and qualifying it. So um, it was, uh, he just really loved the Speedway and um, he always called it his, his Mecca was his, was his term for it. Jade, we'll turn to you now. This is from Paul in San Luis Obispo, California. He says, my favorite John Andretti story was one I heard him tell about when he first started racing for Richard Petty. Richard never called him by his name. John said Richard had this habit of calling everybody buddy. Uh, so he says, uh, Richard called John buddy so much he wasn't sure if Richard ever knew his name. So John was pleasantly surprised when he got his first check and it wasn't made out to buddy Andretti. Uh, <laughs> did he tell you that story and did it make it in the book? Actually, he didn't, um, and uh, I think we have about 50 uh, hours of recording, so unfortunately, some didn't make it in the book, but I do have actually, a, a, he did tell a story about his very first check from Richard Petty. Um, he, his team shut down in the middle of 94, and uh, he went up to Randleman to meet with Richard about taking over the 43 car for the first time. And uh, Richard told him, I, I can only pay you this much because I still have to pay my, my other guy. Uh, and John agreed to it. He was fine with that. And uh, John and some of the crew went to lunch and they came back and Richard came walking out with an envelope. And he said, uh, I don't think I was very fair to you earlier. So here, here's for you. And John later opened it. It was a check for more than Richard had promised him. And it wasn't from the, the Petty team. It was a personal check from Richard Petty. And John just thought that was so amazing that uh, Richard literally paid him uh, from, uh, from his personal check. So uh, that, that is one of the favorite Petty stories that John told. Hmm. And there's, there's hundreds of them like that. <laughs> Wow, that's great. Uh, this one is for all three of you. So 
whoever wants to jump in here can jump in. And if we want to go around the horn, we can. Um, your fondest memory of John, but something maybe others outside of the family would not know if you, if you have one of those that we haven't shared already. Well, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you one uh, that when John lived uh, with us uh, when he was going to college for, um, for four years, and, uh, and I helped him financially, you know, uh, at the beginning, you know, because he, he was racing at the same time. I remember that even Michael was saying, gee, you know, he's racing in the Midwest uh, on Sunday, he's driving all night. Uh, to make the classes for Monday and so forth. So he was quite an example for my kids, which uh, didn't do them much good, but uh, it was a great example. Um, and, uh, but uh, <laughs> the thing about John, and uh, this is the man that he was. Um, you know, I, you know, I was totally prepared to uh, obviously contribute and help him. There was no question. There was uh uh, never a question of uh, wanting to be paid back or anything. And, you know, he, ma he made sure and he insisted they would pay me back every penny, you know, of his college tuition. Now, that's something that, uh, again, it tells a story, uh, just the kind of a man that he was. Uh, and again, uh, I mean, that says volumes, you know, about anyone. Um, and, and like I said, uh, I, I thought that uh, all of a sudden uh, he, he ranked right up here, you know, and, and the way I looked at him as a guy, I said, this guy is going somewhere in life. Garrett, maybe for you, a story of John just being dad to you. Yeah, I think, I think kind of in that same college vein, we, college import, was important. It was never a question whether you were going to go to college or not, whether you, what didn't matter what you want to do, you were going to college. And so I was starting to race at that point and I, I really wanted to race and, and, uh, and moved to Indiana and mom and my dad, you know, sat me down and they said, um, look, you can, you can race and go to college or you can go to college. What do you want to do? And I said, well, I, I guess I'm going to race and go to college. And they said, that's what we thought. So, um, we're going to help you and, uh, you got to keep your grades up and you got to do X, Y, Z. And, um, I don't think I, that picture will ever see the light of day, but when I went to college, he dressed up what he thought was going to be in a, uh, what, what, what guys wear in college, which was a tank top, which was the short shorts, which was the high socks. And, um, it was a pretty hilarious, uh, picture. It was a picture of me cracking up and him giving the big thumbs up. So, uh, I think only me and my mom and my sisters have seen that picture, but, uh, that was, um, that was him being dad. So we, they, they dropped me off at college that day and, I was the oldest and everybody's, you know, my mom, my sisters are crying. And my dad goes, what are you guys crying for? We're going to see him tomorrow. He's racing down here in North Carolina. He goes, you know, this don't need to miss him. He's going to be right back. You know, And, and uh, I was as matter of fact as he is. He was like, you know, that's just Jarrett. Don't, don't, uh, don't worry about him. So uh, I, uh, I love that. And um, so anyway, those are in that college vein. That was, that was really important to him. His college education was a big part of his life. And yeah. um, that's what it, it meant a lot. That's fine. Look at the family that he raised. I mean, you know, the three kids, and uh, again, I mean, they're all, they, you know, very well educated in every way. They all have pressure. And like, you know, you could be uh, Jared, you know, if something goes wrong with Sprint Car or something, you could be a lawyer, it could be anything, right? I, I, I would hope I could be able to be successful. I, I asked, um, so I talked to one time I was in, um, I was talking to somebody and they said, why, why are the sprint car guys? They're usually pretty intelligent guys. Why do they, if they're that much more intelligent, why do they get in faster cars than maybe some of the late model or modified guys? And I said, I can tell you because if we get hurt so badly that we can't race that we can do something else. And the other guys maybe can't. So I said, that's why we get in those cars because we feel like we could do other things. And I said, maybe that's how I'm going to justify it, but that's, that's how I'm going with it. That's my story. That's why I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Never thought of it like that. <laughs> uh. yeah, about you, Dylan. <laughs> about you, Dylan. You thinking the same way? Yeah, something like that. That's what. That's why I went to college too, because we've got. Uh, you've always got the backup plan, right? <laughs> that's great. Uh. 
Oh, I got I to gotta jump in here. I know we've been telling stories, but so they asked, they asked me um, who I wanted to host and they kind of threw out some names. I said, I want, we need to, what about Dylan Welch? I said, that's perfect. So Dylan, we, I've told your dad this story, I think at the wake, but I'm sitting there and uh, we're on a couch and watching the Indianapolis uh, midget race and you're driving, it's a heat race. And we're like, you know, we're like the two biggest Dylan Welch fans of all time at that heat race. We were like, you, I think you had got uh, messed up. You were leading a heat race and then something got happened and then somebody in front of you got crossed up and you won the heat. And dad was like, we were screaming at the top of our lungs. I mean, mom didn't know what was happening. We thought, you know, that was, that was another Andretti driving. And uh, he really enjoyed watching your midget races. He enjoyed, um, he always cheered for you. He, Man, for his little racing he does, he does an awesome job. And um, so I thought this was, when I told Jade that, I said, this is a perfect fit. And um, just know that's that awesome. uh, that he's always cheering for you too. Thank you, Jared. That's that's, awesome. uh, I'm touched by that. So thank you for sharing for sure. Um, I know, and you know, I don't want to speak for my dad, but I, he and I have had a lot of conversations about uh, you and your dad, and I, and I know he feels the same way, and, and I do too. So I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. We'll continue uh, with some more questions. This one comes from Jeff in Dalton, Georgia, for Mario again. Um, he says, could you speak about John's ability to set up a race car, um, particularly when he was a crew chief? And, and Jarrett, you can obviously, you know, explain and elaborate on this too as well. Um, and, and Mario, kind of for you, he says, uh, I remember a comment that, that Mario made at Indy about John finding what was causing the Andretti Autosport cars to be a little off the pace. Can you, do you remember that story? And can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, this goes with uh, the way that uh, he analyzed things. Uh, and um, he wanted to understand the dynamics of suspension, uh, the aerodynamics. You know, he wanted to understand everything that was going on with the car because uh, whenever we talked, you know, usually, hey, we talk racing, right? Uh, you know, he would always have a lot of pertinent questions. And the pertinent questions were exactly about, uh, you know, how important it is to really understand what the car is doing, what the car wants. And I always said, I said, uh, you know, uh, to me, I always looked at uh, this as a real advantage for myself uh, to, to really try to because uh, the better you can set up the car to your style and everything else, the better off you're going to be, the easier things are going to be. And, uh, and, and I think uh, it's so important to be able to try to really understand what is happening so you can uh, be able to, uh, uh, you know, to, to re relate that with, with the engineers. Because I always said it's just like uh, the patient and doctor uh, relationship. Uh, if a patient goes to, a, to the doctor and say, doc, man, I, uh, you know, uh, I'm hurt, man. He said, what's wrong, man? I'm hurting all over. What the heck? You know, where's he going to start? You're going to start, it's going to take a week to find out what's really wrong with you. But if you go in there and articulate, you know, the doctor could zero in on your problem. And it's the same thing with, with drivers. Uh, you know, the more you can articulate what's going on, even have some suggestions, the easier is going to be for you ultimately. And, uh, and John was always full of questions about that. That's one thing that, uh, and, and I always encourage that, you know, because sometimes I didn't get uh, a lot of that, even from my kids, quite honestly. But, uh, you know, you can only, uh, I never offer unless I was asked, you know what I mean? So, uh, but um, this is something that uh, I know really, really worked for me. Um, I mean, just to give you an example, uh, uh, I, you know, even in Formula One, I was using some stagger in Formula One because, uh, you know, before the radials, actually with the cross ply tires, you could change the circumference, the tires with just a little bit of air pressure. And I would use some stagger, but then compensate with the springs to still bring the weights cross properly, you know, without having cross weight. And this is something they did not understand, but what I, they used the stagger for the long corners, you know, be able so you could use a lot of throttle and the stuff. And these are some of the things that really work for me. And the fact that uh, it was not understood there at, at the time, it was working peachy for me. So, but that's just one example of uh, how important it is to really understand what the car wants. 
And, uh, and John was really right on on that. I mean, Jared just alluded to the fact that uh, this one year where he didn't have a ride yet, he was helping other guys on the pit you know, to, 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 to get the cars up to speed, you know, that we get in the car. And then of course, once the, dri the other drivers knew that the car was capable of going that fast and they would go out there and do it, you know, but, uh, and so whenever, when he drove, like even for Michael and so forth, you know, he was a big asset, uh, no question about it because uh, uh, he, he cared. I mean, he cares. It was a, you know, a challenge that I think he loved. Uh, but uh, he also understood, even from driving all the different cars, you know, how important it is to really try to understand, you know, what, what makes these things tick. And, um, and again, that was a great quality that he had. That's why he was successful in all these different disciplines, quite honestly. Because um, he just could, you know, uh, could, could try to understand pretty quick, you know, what the, what the cars needed, even though they were different. But he just really understood what this that and the other did. And Jarrett, for you, I mean, when I worked for USAC, you know, you were you were still kind of new in your sprint car career and, and watching you progress through the years with your dad there turning the wrenches, how valuable was it to have not only your dad with, you know, the knowledge like that, but your crew chief ultimately, you know, having the knowledge and the experience of driving those cars themselves and then being able to, you know, diagnose what problems you may be having. Yeah, I got, I got a couple of good stories. I mean, for one, dad, um, he never let any, if he was around, he squared the rear end and he squared the front end. And he was, that was the most, I mean, he was very, very particular. I mean, there were there were times he spent hours bending arms up back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I'm like, you're going to wear the aluminum out, dad. It wasn't supposed to bend 15 times both ways, you know? And um, he uh, he would build spacers and things like that. And I would, I would give him a hard time. Man, you can build that? Yeah, yeah, I can build them. I'm, I'm good on the machines back there. So um, he would only, I'd just kind of rib him up a little bit, give him a hard time. And uh, I, one night at Hopstop, we were there and um, we decided on what rear bar to run. It was, we were going to run a 1015. And um, we looked at the track and I, I said, okay, well, let's go with the 1015. We're going to run that. And um, after the uh, after the race, I said, man, why do we get so tight? We were, we were leading and then KT and Cummins got around us and we ended up third. And um, he's like, ugh. he came over and like sat down. He was like, you know, I put the thousand in on you. I said, what? I was screaming at him. I threw my helmet bag. What are you doing? <laughs> oh my God. You know, and, and I, 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 you know, five minutes later, I, I, I felt, you know, about this small. And I said, you know, I'm thinking, hey, you're on your, your freaking dad and he's just trying to help you. And I said, that's not the reason we lost the race, dad. Okay. You know, I, I, that's not the reason we, you know, we, we 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 could have ran the ten, the twelve, or the thousand. We would have we would have we would have ran the same. So don't let that bother you. We'll go to next week, and that's it. But I remember throwing my helmet bag around and all mad and acting like <laughs> acting like a child. So, and he did. Uh, there there was times that he did the same to me. Why'd you do that? Why didn't you go to the top? Why didn't you go to the bottom? And so uh, I think for us, we were both in there together, and we were both in it together as much as we can. And um, no matter uh, how how mad we got at each other for whatever happened we weren't actually mad at each other and we would still uh you know we would still where do you want to go to dinner let's go to applebee's okay so we go to applebee's and we we'd cover it and it'd be over so one of the hardest and most fun things to do is go on racing with your dad <laughs> yeah. yeah all right um Let's see, answered that one for Jarrett. Uh, so let's go Jade to you. Uh, this is from Wendy in Davidson, North Carolina. She says, as an author, uh, and, and you did explain this a little bit, but I'll maybe just have you, you know, expand on it a little bit. How did you get to know John? Um, and as you were composing this book, did you guys do any activities with him or, or was it largely just kind of listening and, and taking notes on the couch like you talked about earlier? Yeah, um, it was mostly that um, our agreement, the agreement I had with him was uh, he was still going through a lot of his treatments. So we would schedule a day to get together. But the agreement was if he was not feeling up to it that day, that, that we could cancel. Um, he never did cancel on me, but there were days when I'd get there um, and you could tell he was just not feeling well. He would never complain, but his energy level was low. And we'd sit down, and after the first story or two, it, it's, it's like 
his color would come back and, and like his energy level would go up. Um, and so to me, that was, that was sort of meaningful to me to sort of see that, that he got so energized by sharing, um, stories and uh, a lot of the racing stories, but a lot of the family stories, uh, you know, family just meant so much to him and, and he would always light up when he was talking about Jared or his daughters and certainly uh, Mario and Michael. So uh, to, to me, that was, that was the most meaningful part of going to see him at, at the house. And uh, so that, that, meant a lot to me. I'm not sure if that really directly answered the question, but, uh, but that, that's what meant the most. Jared, kind of speaking about family, um, we saw Aldo a lot at, at, at John's races, even when he was, uh, when he was younger, uh, with John being your dad and, and Aldo and John's relationship, what kind of things, uh, did you see, uh, you know, maybe reflected in John from Aldo or, or, you know, that sort of thing? Well, it's funny. We talk about places that we liked and disliked as drivers. And it, it's just interesting how um, dad would go, you're going to like this place. I always liked this place. And, you know, Nono liked this place. And I would show up and sure enough, I, I, I would take to it naturally. And then there was some places he goes, man, I never did figure out this track. Let's see if, let's see if you can. And inevitably that would be harder for me. So I don't know if it was predisposed when I showed up because he said that, or if it was something naturally genetics that um, something just didn't click at some of those places as fast as I clicked at other places. Um, but I think for, um, for him having Nono around, or my grandfather, um, you know, I think it was always something like, it, it, there's always a calming influence to have them at the track and to have um, dad at the track, because I knew he was always watching out for me and watching out my back and um even when he was sick we i mean i remember one time we were at the push shoot at kokomo and he's running down the push shoot as fast as he can and, he, and he's saying you gotta, you gotta run here you gotta do this i said dad dad i'm i'm gonna transfer it's gonna be okay don't run like that ever again you know and i and he was like but he was he was a competitor and that's what he and he, he thought if that could get him if that could get you a spot if that could get you a little bit less anxiety that's what he was going to do. And, um, I think that, um, yeah, you, you, I'm going to miss, miss, you miss somebody that's going to be in the trenches with you no matter what. And that's, that's what family is. Right. Mario, what about you, your brother, Aldo, um, a great racer in his own right, but what kind of, uh, or do you have any stories maybe where you saw, um, you know, his fatherly influence on John? Well, I, I think one thing about Aldo, he, you always felt that he had just had your back one way or another, you know, the encouragement uh, or anything. He, he just wanted to be there and, uh, and share with you, you know, the good and the bad. And, uh, but uh, again, he was another one that I remember many times, you know, that uh, John just loved to tinker a lot, you know, loved to uh, make changes and everything. And, and other would say that, Doggone it, you know, you're changing too much. You always do it because he didn't totally understand what he was doing, but he always felt this, you know, just go out there and drive, you know, <laughs> things like that. But, uh, um, you know, Aldo, uh, again, even, uh, you know, with me, I remember that, uh, you know, just some of the experiences that we've had was uh, some of actually quite funny. Uh, but uh, I always felt that uh, he was riding with us, you know, when he was there. And, um, and never, you know, because uh, obviously, uh, you know, he, his situation, the way it was, you know, his career was cut short and everything else. And he had the same dreams and, uh, and same love and passion that we had, but uh, was never be able to realize it. But he did realize it through us. And, uh, and that was clear, you know, without any uh, sense of, um, you know, jealousy or anything else, if you will. Um, he was enjoying it so much. I, I, I have some uh, photos, you know, of us, uh, you know, him in Victory Lane and so forth. You could see how jovial he was, you know, just uh, just sharing the moment. And, um, and as you say, it's all about family, you know, that, uh, you know, we feel good for one another when things are going well. And, um, and I just... Uh, I always love to have him around because uh, 
his sense of humor too, you know, things were never really tough for him. You know, he always had a way to, uh, to look at the light side and, um, and calm things down. So, uh, yeah, I think his, his demeanor, I think is always very important. Uh, so he, he served his purpose for sure. You know, and that was always valuable, you know, to have him around from my standpoint. Jade, we can keep this rolling. What did you learn about Aldo's influence on John as you were composing this book? Well, I really think Aldo is sort of the 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 leading uh, co-star, I guess, to use a movie term to John. Um, he just, he shared about, it, it, the way his dad looked at life, uh, just what Mario was saying, um, Aldo just has a, a very positive view of life. And uh, John said they called him Aldoism, Al Aldoisms. Aldo had all kinds of sayings and things, and he was always very positive. And John talked about how that really, that really influenced him, not just as a race car driver, but just, just as a, as a person and being a, being a dad. So um, I'm anxious for people to, to read in the book, uh, uh, just what a cool guy Aldo is and, and what he meant to John. It's a, it's a big part of the book. That's great. Look forward to reading about that for sure. Uh, Mario, let's go back to you. Um, we've, we've talked about John's versatility as a driver, how he could seemingly get in anything and be fast. Uh, 1993 season, for example, this comes from Philip, by the way, in, in Edison, New Jersey, 1993, John drove an Indy car, NASCAR, and an NHRA top fuel car, uh, and plenty of other vehicles while being a prototype sports car ace, uh, before going full-time NASCAR. Uh, Mario, did that versatility that he showed, uh, bring back any memories for you in your younger days when you were uh, racing sprint cars and champ dirt cars and F1 and IndyCar all at the same time? I think it all comes down to the love of driving, love of driving a race car. And uh, uh, I, always, I always felt that there was a, a, a very special challenge, a lot of satisfaction to be able to move around the, the, the disciplines, to, you know, to some degree, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, in his situation, he was uh, he was forced to do it. You know, if something was going on here, he was not going to sit home and he went to something else, but he adapted quickly. Why? Because uh, I don't know if there's any formula for that. I think it's all down to, to passion, passion and love of driving. And, um, and again, you can see that uh, looking at his versatility aspect, I mean, it's second to none, you know, really. Um, uh, you look back at, of course, you know, uh, you know you're not going to see too many drivers today drive a sprint car and then go and, and, and drive a sports prototype car. I mean, Jared is probably the last one that's going to be doing that, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, with us, it was a normal thing to do. And, uh, and again, uh, it all comes down to just love and passion. That's what drives it all. And um, he certainly had that. He showed that. Um, I was jealous that he was uh, able to experience 300 miles an hour in the top fuel, you know, which I never, uh, you know, but uh, uh, here again, I mean, here it shows all of a sudden I had out of nowhere, you know, I figure, oh, uh, I said, John is out there like uh, trying to be big daddy, you know, and uh, <laughs> you know, trying to be the snake. Uh, and, uh, and he did it well, you know. Uh, so, like I said, if uh, things were empty somewhere else, he'd, he'd fill the schedule, you know. And, and you know, there was, there was plenty of disciplines to choose from in our sport. And uh, But for him to wind up in, in uh, top fuel, I never in the world ever thought. And there he was, you know. <laughs> uh, and I was so proud of that, you know. I said, that, that's, that's awesome. And... Uh, that's the quality of guy that he had. And, and again, uh, experiences like that. I mean, how many drivers can really make those statements? You know, not too many. You probably can't, you can't even count them in a, you know, on the fingers of one hand. So uh, that, that's something very special. Um, something that he obviously was very proud. I was very proud of, uh, of him just to know that he, he did all that. 
Yeah, no doubt. There, when you think of guys like that who were so versatile, it's, it's guys like you and AJ and, and more recently guys like Tony Stewart. But John certainly was in that category and, and should yeah. be included every time that conversation oh, is had God, because he's, he's a guy that just yeah. raced anything whenever he could and had success doing it all. That's success, yes. Yeah. I, if I could jump in, the, the, there is a full chapter about his drag racing in the book, and it's one of my favorite chapters. It's just great storytelling. And at the end, he said, you know, I really loved it, but I like to drive more than five seconds at a time. So that was kind of his closing thought about his experience in a top fuel car. Yeah, it doesn't take long to get those runs over with when you're going 300 <laughs> miles an hour. Yes. <laughs> Um, Jarrett, let's, um, let's bring you in here. This is from Anthony uh, LaRocca from Memphis. He wants to know what your upcoming race calendar looks like for 2020 and beyond. Are, are you still partnered with Window World? Uh, and will we see you back on the national stage, uh, maybe in like an Indy Lights car or anything? Obviously not this year, but maybe in the future. Yeah, I think um, Window World is still a big part of our program. They've been uh, fantastic partners of ours for, for many, many years. And, um, you know, Dad ran his his last couple races in a, in window world car and they've been great to us in so many ways. So they are still partnered. Um, right now we're going to run the sprint car. Um, like I said, before we started this, I'm going to run, um, probably, you know, 12 to eight, probably about 12 sprint car shows between now and the end of July and another six or so road races. So, uh, we're in about 18, 18 races between now and the end of July. So I'm going to do the GT four stuff and some sprint car stuff. Um, and then just some, whatever else I can, uh, I can kind of pencil in, in, in that time. So, um, the, the schedule, even though it's pretty packed with everything that's going on, there's still some open weekends. So, um, I think, uh, you know, one of the things I do want to do and one of the things dad asked me to do, um, was you need to drive a top fuel dragster is one of the things that he said. So I think at some point it's certainly on the bucket list of things to do. And, um, he said, um, he said, it's quite a rush. So uh, that's one of the things I'd like to do on a national stage at some point, and, and hopefully I get a chance to go back to the Speedway as well. You're braver than I am. I'll give you that much. <laughs> uh, Mario and Jade, this one is for you. Um, and, and a lot of people may not even realize this. Uh, this is from Allen in, in Brownsburg, Indiana. Um, Mario, over the course of your career in rivalry with AJ, uh, did you ever question why AJ was John's godfather? Uh, I think at one point I could say I was surprised, but uh, I think it was his mom, Corky, that just asked Jay, AJ if he would be John's godfather, and AJ accepted. I think that was the case. I don't know anything else, but uh, I always thought that was kind of good, actually. You know, um, uh, Obviously, AJ didn't always see eye to eye, but uh, that probably figured – then there's some hope between us, I guess. <laughs> that, uh, that kind of, that kind of I mean, uh, uh, heck, you know, right now we're our best friends, you know, so uh, uh, that had something to do with it. Jay, what did John have? Yeah, what did John have to say? Well, yeah, I was going to say I'll jump in because John had some good AJ stories. Uh, and r before I forget to, uh, the book has four forwards. Uh, so Mario has one. Uh, Michael has one, AJ did one, and then Richard Petty. So those are the four gentlemen that lead off the book. So I'm very proud of that and thrilled they could jump in. Um, John's favorite story was after he had uh, become AJ's uh, godson, Aldo tells the story that I guess Mario, you and, and AJ were racing at Michigan and AJ got on the radio and he told his crew, he said, hey, tell the WAP to move over. We're family now. And so John thought that was a, a great story uh, from the days when, uh, as AJ said, the newspapers tried to keep you fighting, but uh, it was always great. I'm sure it worked. I'm sure it worked. <laughs> <laughs> we've, uh, we've got about 10 minutes or so left, so we'll, uh, we'll keep these rolling here. Uh, Mario, this one's for you uh, from Anthony in Memphis. Uh, the Andretti family name is, is obviously probably most well known for, your success in open wheel racing. Um, but when John decided to make the jump to NASCAR in, in the mid nineties, uh, what was the, uh, the consensus kind of among the family of, of that decision and, and, uh, how that all went down? Well, from my standpoint, I mean, uh, especially, uh, I think it was his first ride. Was it with uh, Richard? Was it? Or, uh, 
You know, he did uh, Hagen and then yeah. Hagen. Yeah, Hagen. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, go for it. And why not? Uh, like I said, that if he would have preferred probably with a top team in Indy cars, I would assume that. But again, he was not going to sit idle. And then why not? You know, NASCAR, obviously, uh, popular as it is, <clears throat> he, uh, I think he made the right move and, and sure as heck showed that it was, a, it was a good move, you know, ultimately. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I would always uh, encourage that, quite honestly. Uh, Jarrett, we'll, we'll get a couple more from you here. Um, you went to school, obviously, as we talked about earlier. So this question comes from uh, Joe Aguera in Indianapolis. He says, did you ever consider pursuing a career in something other than auto racing? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I got into racing late. And, and the, the interesting part about that was, um, as it, you can imagine, it was, it was dad's fault. Uh, and, um, and the reason was, uh, so he got, came off the road. He wanted to, my sisters were getting older. I was getting older. And he wanted to spend more time with family. And so he bought himself a go-kart. And I got in the go-kart and pretty soon I was going to go there and help him lift it on the stand and work on it for him and with him. And he was just kind of going to do some father-son time. Well, more and more, pretty soon he wasn't driving it at all. And I was the only one driving it. And we were racing it. And, you know, my mom, she's over there. She's, you know, pulling her hair out, thinking that I kept him out of racing for 17 years. And you bring this go-kart in one year too early. And now we're, uh, we're doing every, you know, now we're, now we're on tour. So we, we were, one time we were laughing, we're driving down the road and he's like, I, I, I got a go-kart. So I wasn't on the road. Now I'm on the road more. I don't get to drive and I'm not making any money. He's like, this is the worst trade ever. You know, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm sorry. You're the one that bought it. That's not my fault. That's your problem. And uh, the, my mom had a, <laughs> My mom had a quote that uh, she goes, well, I kept him out of it for 17 years. I think I did a pretty good job. So uh, I think that, uh, I, I forget what the question was, but um, I think those answered it. And uh, we, we were going to do other things other than racing, but it just kind of naturally evolved into this. And dad loved the sprint cars. He wanted me to race a lot. He thought the sprint cars were the hardest car and competition in the world. And so that's where I went sport, sprint car racing. And, and that's why we're still there. Hmm. I, if I can jump in on that, uh, John, Jarrett, John talks about the first day that you wanted to get in the cart. And he said, Jarrett was very quick, but not as quick as me. He was like very clear about that. He said, I would have been super impressed, but I would have been very depressed if my son would have gone out day one and he, gone he quicker. Always, so <laughs> the thing is, is he always, um, the dad, people talk about dad never retired. That's a common misconception. And he would refuse to say he was retired. So Last year, we had multiple deals uh, lined up. We were going to drive, actually, for one of our buddies, David Tilton, um, in a front-wheel drive car at Coda. He was going to drive that. We were, I was testing once, and he was trying to move his port so we could get the seatbelt <laughs> on. And, you know, you can't move your port. It's hooked to your vein. You know, you can put a chemo right in there. And, and he's like, I think I can do it, Jarrett. I'm like, you know, you do whatever you want, but I'm not having that conversation with mom. You are. And um, <laughs> so there were multiple times he was going to end up, actually, he was going to be my co-driver last year um, if this wouldn't have hit. So there, there's a lot of, um, I think it, I would have loved to have raced with him, but he very much had a lot of pride and, um, and he was a very, very good race car driver. It, I think I, I would have been hard pressed to say that I would have been quicker. I, I'm, I never would say that. So um, <laughs> even at 50 something years old, he would, he would have, he was good. He was very good. And, and Mario, on that note, we are running out of time. So I'll just ask you to keep this quick if you can. But as the, the one to compete against John, you know, not only be family, but compete against him. Uh, what was it like to compete against, you know, John, the race car driver? Well, it's family again. You know, it's something that uh, you can never design. It just either happens or it doesn't. And uh, that's what I say when I go back and, uh, and look at the opportunity as a family that we've had to share the same track and race against one another. I know the girls back there, as Jara said, were pulling their hair, obviously, because uh, we were not kind to each other. You know, we were not giving each other any favors uh, or giving an inch. Uh, but, uh, but we were going to take care of each other. We we're not going to be dangerous. But at the same time, as I say, there were times where we were wheel to wheel. And, um, and, but it was uh, 
the competitive spirit that was always taking over. And we love that. We love that opportunity. Um, again, uh, as a family, like I said, those are the, pre the most precious moments of my career. Quite honestly, when I had the opportunity to drive against, you know, with John on the track and my, and my own two sons, quite honestly. Wonderful. Guys, we are out of time, but I, I want to thank you all uh, for sharing such great memories and, and wonderful stories of John and uh, appreciate you guys taking the time to do this tonight. My pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. Thank you, guys. And folks, uh, for all of you that did join us, we'd like to, of course, thank you as well. Uh, all of our guests here tonight are, are active on social media. Mario is at Mario Andretti on Twitter and Facebook uh, and at Andretti Mario on Instagram. Jarrett, uh, that is one R, two T's, is at Jarrett Andretti on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Jade is at Jade Gurs, G-U-R-S-S, -S, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Uh, and I'm at uh, Dylan underscore Welch on Twitter and Instagram. You can also find Octane Press on all those platforms as well, at Octane Press. We could go on all night, uh, and I wish we could, with stories about John and what a special person he was. The book is, as you would expect, jammed, packed to the gills with story after story. Uh, and we look forward to hearing all of your reaction to the book. Uh, and, and please share those you know, with us if you can. Uh, you can learn more about the book uh, if you're interested at octanepress.com. And uh, Octane Press is proud to be part of such an important book. We thank all of you again for joining us tonight uh, and hope you enjoyed tonight's chat. Thank you and good night.